Good morning, or good afternoon, I guess. The sun hasn't shown yet today, but it really is afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm Jana Overstreet, and I'm the Executive Director of the Lifelong Learning Academy, and I want to welcome you to our final lecture of um, spring of 2015. We will reconvene with lectures next fall, but um, we've had a great year at the Academy. We've served more students than ever before, um, held more classes, had fantastic instructors, and we're looking forward to a fun summer. We have just started our summer registration. So those of you who have not looked over the summer course listing, uh, we have catalogs out on the table that you can pick up afterwards. Um, one of the things that I want to do today is I want to honor someone who has really put in a valiant effort this year. Um, she has put together seven lectures and 16 Einstein circles for us in this past year. Her name is Bev Harms. Now, Bev had the good sense to tell us that next year she just wants to go back to do an Einstein circle. So, <laughs> so since this is her last lecture, I wanted to give her just a little token of our appreciation. It's a surprise, isn't it? You can open, she can open it later. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so I would like to introduce to you Bev Harms, um, who helps us a great deal as a board member, a volunteer, and an all-around supporter of the Academy. Thanks, Jana. Thank you, Jana. Our topic today is partisan politics and the 2016 election. And here to talk about it is former Congressman Dan Miller. Elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1992. Oh, we have some USF students. How wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, Dan Miller, elected to the U.S. House of Rep Representatives in 1992. Dan represented the 13th Congressional District of Florida, which included all of Sarasota and Manatee counties. Dan was born in Michigan and raised in Florida. He graduated from Manatee High School and received his BS degree from the University of Florida and went on to earn an MBA at Emory University and a PhD in Marketing and Statistics from Louisiana State University. Subsequently, he taught, um, he taught university level statistics and marketing before becoming a, su a successful Southwest Florida entrepreneur. Dan had never held public office before his election to Congress. During his 10 years in the House of Representatives, he served on the House Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee and as chairman of the Census Committee with oversight of the U.S. Census Bureau during the controversial and successful year 2000 Census. In keeping with his promise of a self-imposed 10-year term limit, he retired from Congress in, the, in 2003. After leaving, he returned to academia. In 2003, he became a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard, at Harvard University. He teaches for the Lifelong Learning Academy here at USFSM, and he teaches on university campuses around the country for the Congress to Campus program, bringing together former members of Congress, students, and faculty for the purpose of increasing civic liter literacy and encouraging participation by providing an authentic and candid look at the workings of American politics and government by insiders who have been there. It's both my privilege and my pleasure to introduce former Congressman Dan Miller. Thank you, Bev. Uh, how's the sound system? Is it okay? All right. Um, I've, this is, I think, my third Einstein circle. No, it's no longer a circle. Uh, in 10 years, she's been doing it. It's, it's a volunteer job, or you get big paid for this. <laughs> uh, the first time I did it, we met in a, like a conference room over in the, uh, one of the in just one of the classroom areas, and so it's built into now having it in the auditorium. So it's a lot of work to plan these for a whole year for Bev. I know, she, I think you contacted me last October when we were up in North Carolina in the mountains 
and it's like, how do I plan for, you know, April of this year? So, uh, um, uh, any rate, thank you for all you've done for that. It's, you do a, a good service, a great volunteer, and we appreciate it. Um, before I get started, I want, I've told some people here, I'm going to use PowerPoint today, and this is the first time I've used PowerPoint. <laughs> so, you know, this is a learning experience. I appreciate it. And any advice you have, uh, hopefully, you know, you'll share with me. Uh, it's, it's kind of I self-taught myself on PowerPoint, which is, um, it's kind of funny. Those that have done PowerPoint, every time you get into it, you say, oh, I can do this. Like I put color on it last, yesterday or something. It's a uh, different color. But at any rate, uh, so be patient with me on this PowerPoint we're going to get into. The, uh, and I got my clicker here somewhere. Let me get a clicker here. Uh, so, the, you know, I got elected to Congress, I ran in co for Congress in 1992, and there's some people in this room that were there supporting me, Ted, Harlan Twibel here, some people that go back to my first campaign in 1992 when I ran. Uh, I was never in politics. My first campaign ad back in 92 was, I never lived in Washington, never worked for the federal government, and never ran for elected office. So that qualified me. Uh, <laughs> my district was Sar all Sarasota County, all Manatee County, into Charlotte County, down in uh, 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 Murdoch, and then up to Sun City and Ruskin uh, at that time. So it was a fairly compact district, but it was a great district to represent. When I went up there, I remember the first going through orientation uh, and with all the other new members, and I was kind of, I was naive to get in this. I, you know, this campaigning was rough stuff, and uh, those of y'all were with me back in 92. It was, it was uh, you know, very difficult running for elected office. And then I get elected, it's like the dog catching the bus that's chasing it. You know, he said, what do I do now? And so I get up to Washington. I, my experience of Washington is, you know, I took my, grand, my kids there. I went there as a child. I mean, not much else. Well, I get up there and then I realize I'm not too bad off. <laughs> it, it's not, even though a lot of the people have legislative experience, um, it was easy to fit in. But the question I used to get asked a lot when I first, um, would, after I got sworn in in January, I'd come home and said, uh, what was the, um, the most different thing that you expected? Uh, and so I said, it was the partisanship of Congress. It was a very partisan place back in 1993. It's very partisan today, but you know, when I went up there, I was, I'm a Republican. The Democrats completely controlled the state place. The, the House had been under Democrat control for 40 years. The Senate was in, under Democratic control. And Bill Clinton had just been elected president. The, the Democrats are kind of giddy uh, with all the power they had. And so as a Republican, as a freshman Republican, you felt like you were irrelevant. Uh, now things changed in the 94 election. Republicans took over and I became part of the majority. And so it's much nicer to be in the majority up there than the minority. The minority, especially in the House, is, has limited what they can do. I used to say the goal of the minority was just to work to become the majority, which is um, unfortunate, but that's the way the system works. So it doesn't matter who's in charge, Republicans or Democrats, the minority has a limited role. The Senate's a little different, um, though it's changing too, but the minority has a little more power and influence. But in the House, it, it's a very large um, um, gap between who is a minority and who is a majority. Uh, you know, this is fun when you start doing PowerPoint. You, uh, see, I get to see my slides back there, too. So let me get used to this. One thing about PowerPoint, those that have used it, you, your lecture goes on PowerPoint rather than my outline notes. I've always lectured with outline notes, and now I've got this. By the way, I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. I'm going to do partisan politics first, and we'll do questions and discussion. So the first half will be partisan politics, and then we'll jump into the 2016 election. Obviously, there's going to be some overlap, but... Uh, you know, when we talk about partisanship, the American people are more partisan today than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. This is from the Pew Research, which is a highly respected uh, uh, nonprofit uh, in, well, I don't know where they're located in Washington for the, this part of it. But it shows the median uh, ideology of Republicans and Democrats between 1994 and to 2014. There's a bigger gap with the American public today than there was 20 years ago. So just because we say Congress is partisan, it's really the American people that have moved their uh, partisanship on. The problem about partisanship, one of the things is, is you can identify it by geography and demographics. I mean, look at the geography here. 
Uh, this, this is the election by county, red being Republican, blue being Democrats. Uh, we use that red and blue all the time. That just happened with one of the networks back in, I think, in the 1992 election or something like that, that they started using that color and now everything's red and blue, but it was just an accidental thing. But the Democrats are very, in the blue, are very heavily concentrated. Let's see this. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Uh, right along the coast, of, you know, Pacific coast. They're very big up here in the northeast. And um, these are some rural areas in the south, in the Mississippi Delta, where there's a lot of uh, African Americans, some Hispanic districts. But the big presence of, uh, of the Democrats are in urban centers, Chicago, but the rest of the state is quite red. You look at St. Louis, I mean, um, Missouri. It's almost all red, but there's a lot of population in the St. Louis area. So you can look at Ohio, but look at the population here. So the Democrats are more focused, more located in urban centers than um, the Republicans who are much more spread out. Uh, we can look at the state of Florida, and this, the darker blue is more um, the stronger Democrat air vote for president in 2012, and the darker red is the strongest uh, vote for uh, Romney. And what we'll see up there is uh, the blue, this is Tallahassee. In Tallahassee, you have two state universities, Florida State University and Florida A&M University. You have the state government. That's a, there's an area where there's a strong Democratic uh, voting going on. Then we get to Tala uh, Gainesville, a lateral county where the University of Florida is. And then where we see the Democrats are strong in the St. Pete Tampa area is, is light blue. Orlando here. And then where most of the Democrats in the state of Florida are in this Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area in, in total numbers. Um, and that, that's a different dynamic than what you have up in Tallahassee. But the, when we start drawing district lines and all, and we'll get into that in a minute, the whole issue of uh, gerrymandering and such, uh, it's the Democrats are concentrated, Republicans are more spread out. Um, we also can look at demographics. This is just a, a short little uh, piece about how the voters are. Uh, and uh, we can see uh, red being Republican, men more likely to vote Republican than, uh, um, than women. But come down here at the bottom. When you get to married people, uh, it's more, married people are more likely to vote Republican. Single people are more likely to vote Democrat. And if you actually look at this, like uh, white uh, married and white single, it's even stronger difference that Democrats appeal there. You can look at religion. I don't think this chart shows religion. Um, uh, well, you know, when you get to um, uh, things like evangelical Protestants, heavily Republican, the Jewish vote is over 60% Democrat. Uh, the age gap, we can see the ages. Uh, the black vote, it's, you know, even before Obama, 90% of blacks voted Democrat. Though interesting, I, I didn't realize this, a black friend told me this, back before Roosevelt, blacks were Republican because Lincoln was president. <laughs> it was the re first Republican president. But that changed with Roosevelt. Um, one thing, and, and whites, Obama got 39% of the uh, white vote. Uh, now, what's happening with it, and this is 2012, we're finding in the polls now, white blue collars are moving more and more to the Republicans. Uh, so th there's a concern that we're getting too much uh, segmentation in the way we vote. Um, so the American people are already divided. And what's happened politically is we've had this party realignment over the past, especially 20 years, it goes back maybe to the 1960s. And that the Democratic Party has become a liberal party, the Republican Party has become a conservative party. And there are almost no moderates left. They're just kind of gone, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the elections nowadays are pretty much always decided in primaries rather than general elections. This area of Sarasota Bradenton, this area may not realize it, is 50, it voted 54% for Mitt Romney in the last election. When I ran in 92, the key election was winning the Republican primary. Once I won the Republican primary, it was not going to be much doubt I would be elected the congressperson from this area. It's a fairly safe Republican area. Now, Bernie McCann has had some problems. Um, early on because some really good Democrats run against him, but now he's in a pretty safe seat. Uh, and just to show you how primaries make the difference, when Vern ran, 
in 2006, uh, and the district voted this past time 54% for Romney. But he won, he won this congressional seat representing 700,000 people with 20,918 votes. Kathy Castor is the congresswoman up in the Tampa and part of St. Pete. Now, we'll look at her district here in a minute. When she ran in 2006, she got 21,310 votes. A, that district voted 65% for Barack Obama. There's no way she can be challenged by a, um, uh, a Republican. She's in a safe Democratic seat. And uh, so all you have to do is win 21,000 seats and you represent 700,000 people. Um, Trey Ray Dell, and I, he's the, the Republican congressman that bought cocaine a year or so ago and decided not to stay in office. Um, <laughs> but he represents the Fort Myers Naples area. It's just a compact district, very Republican. It voted, that district voted 61% for Romney. Um, he won the primary back in 2012 with 22,000 votes. His successor, um, Kurt Carson, Clawson, I think it is, won in a special election. And it turns out interesting, this Kurt Clawson is a real hardcore Tea Party person, representing Fort Myers Naples. I don't think Fort Myers Naples, I don't know it well, but it's not a hardcore Tea Party county. I mean, not county, but an area. But, uh, uh, so what I'm pointing out is that it doesn't take many votes. And who votes in primaries? The most conservative and the most liberal voters are the ones that vote. Uh, we, everybody says, oh, we have more independents, more independents. Yeah, you know, 40% of the people say they're independent. But if you push them, like this Gallup poll shows, you know, most people say, oh, I'm an independent. Then you ask the question, well, are you, do you vote mainly Republican or do you main, vote mainly Democrat? Well, people vote, even though they're independent, they say it. You know, a lot of Republicans, because of some, uh, some conservative positions of social issues and all, don't want to identify as a Republican. But they end up voting Republican. And so what you really find is that most Americans identify with one party or the other. What's, you know, right now it's 45 to 42 percent. You know, probably 75, 80 percent of the American people know who they're going to vote for next November in the presidential election. You realize that? I mean, if you think about it in this room, most of you all know who you're going to vote for, and you don't even know who the candidates are. What, what's happened to the middle are these wave elections. And the wave elections is, we, they don't happen very often, but a wave election is when one party just overwhelmingly uh, dominates the election cycle. Uh, there was one back in 1974 where uh, uh, the, right after Watergate, you know, people just want to get rid of the Republicans in Congress and a lot of Democrats got elected. And then when I was in Congress in 94, uh, Republicans picked up 54 seats and defeated 34 sitting incumbent Democrats. That's a wave election. Normally, you don't get, you know, less than 10 people get, incumbents get defeated. But this time, in 94, Republicans took control of Congress and had 54 more seats. For me personally, that made my seniority much better uh, because I, get, I got elected in 92, and so there were 54 Republicans more junior than me. I got on the Appropriations Committee then, was able to, you know, Help me from that standpoint. Um, so in 94, Republicans took over. And then in 2006, people were mad at Bush. They, you know, uh, Katrina, they were, thought he was incompetent running government. People were mad at the Iraq war. And they came out in numbers and uh, defeated, um, what did we defeat? 22 Republicans were defeated and 27 new Democrats came to Congress. They took control of the House and the Senate that year. That was a wave election. I remember that election because a lot of my friends lost. It was good moderate Republicans that just had R after their name were defeated. I, uh, that year I was invited to go to Harvard. The Kennedy School has an orientation for new members of Congress. And so I was invited to go up and talk about the budget issue of the new members. And there was all, it was all the freshman Democrats, these new Democrats elected, who had just defeated good friends of mine. And they went around the room the first night. We had a little cocktail hour. And, and I remember one said, I, you know, I defeated the nicest man in Congress, Jim Leach, a moderate or a liberal Republican from Iowa. Another person stood up and said, I defeated Clay Shaw, the second nicest person in Congress. I mean, good people that are no reason to be defeated, just are after their name. And then, uh, but in 94, the same thing happened. And then in 2010, you know, 52, you know, after Obama came in in, in, nine, in 09, they passed Obamacare, the stimulus package, uh, 
people were mad at Obama and all, and so 63 new Republicans came in in 2010. So the people that got defeated in these wave elections were the moderates. If you're in a conservative district or a liberal district, nothing's gonna happen to you probably. You're gonna survive it. So what's happened is we don't have any moderates left. This is the House. Look at how it's changed from 1982. There's hardly anyone left in the middle. There used to be a group called Blue Dogs when I was there. They're not there anymore. In the Senate, I think there's one moderate Democrat left. I mean, the Southern conservative Democrats are gone. Um, the one that's left is in West Virginia. Um, can't think of his name right now. But in the last election, Mary Landrew lost. She was the uh, uh, Southern moderate Democrat. Uh, there's one in uh, Arkansas. Uh, they just lost because they were Democrats. I mean, people vote party line more than ever before. It used to be split party voting was more common, I think, when we grew up. But it's changed. It used to be also when we, we were voting early, most of y'all are my generation. You know, you know, Nelson Rockefeller was a left of center Republican. Strom Thurmond was a right of center Democrat. <laughs> uh, so the, both parties had this big tent theory. That's gone. I mean, we have no, hardly any middle left. Uh, and the main thing is, this is that same map, basically. I think it's the same map that shows us the, the sorting of where people choose to live. It's not gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is part of it, and we'll show about gerrymandering. But it's that Democrats are concentrated in one area. When I um, got elected, I represented Sun City. And I, and I, didn't, I don't know how many people know where Sun City is. Halfway between uh, Tampa and Bradenton. It's a big, nice retirement community up there. Really nice. That is hardcore Republican territory. I, you know, I didn't have to do anything. I got 70% of the vote up there. Uh, I remember Sam Gibbons, who was a congressman from Tampa back at the time, said, I said, I am so glad to get rid of that Sun City to you. I couldn't do anything to make those Republicans happy. <laughs> it, it was just a hardcore Republican area. So Republicans live with Republicans, Democrats live with Democrats. Uh, I'm, I'm not a sociologist to explain it. Um, we just look at Senate elections. And that'll tell you, you know, Senate, the state boundaries, this actually, I'm going to come to this chart later because that's the electoral college, right? Well, they're looking at projections. But what you find is, these are safe you know, seats. I mean, you're, you're running for a Senate in Alabama or Arkansas or Idaho, you know, Republicans gonna win it. Now, there, once in a while what happens, there happens to be a, a Democrat in North Dakota and West Virginia, which will vote Republican in next November, there is a, um, a Democrat. But if you go over here, Illinois happens to have a, uh, Republican senator in Maine, Susan Collins, is there. But the one in Illinois, uh, they got elected in that wave election of 2010. Uh, Mark Kirk, he'll probably get defeated. So most states are already safe. That's the reason when we look at the, there's only like a dozen swing states in the United States. Mitt Romney won 24 states, uh, Obama won uh, 26 states. So the Senate is always gonna be a kind of a toss up. Am I causing problems moving around too much, Charles? Okay, um, and then, now we get to the House, where I serve. It's, I said it's really the sorting of the population. Republicans like to live around other Republicans, and Democrats like to live around other Democrats. You go down Broward County in Fort Lauderdale, two million people live there, it voted 65% for Barack Obama. Go straight across Alligator Alley to uh, Collier County, um, Naples, and it voted 60-some percent for Mitt Romney. I mean, Republicans like Naples, Democrats like uh, <laughs> Fort Lauderdale. I'll take Naples any day over Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> um, redistricting is something, as you know, is required in our Constitution. Every 10 years, you do a census, and then you draw the lines, and all the districts have to be the exact same size. Um, every state decides how they go about doing that. Um, so some states, is just the legislature. Sometimes it's the legislature, like in Florida but the governor has a veto. Like in Florida, the governor has veto over congressional districts, but for drawing state senate and state house districts, it's the legislature and the governor doesn't have a veto. Some states have started these commissions, independent commissions. And what's interesting is, I think it's before the Supreme Court currently, is, is questioning the constitutionality of these commissions. Because the Constitution gives the power to the states. Can the states give it to someone else? I don't know where that's going. But even when you ha have independent commissions, it doesn't change very much because of the sorting. And the other big thing are these 
minority district requirements. I'll get to that here in a second. And the fact that Democrats are heavily concentrated in urban areas. Uh, so what, what we have is this area here, you know, there's a Democrat representing this area now, but it's a swing district. It's like 50-50. Um, the Tampa area, I'll show you that district in a minute. But there's like four, four or five Democratic congressmen down here. And so it, it, to try to draw a district to have more Republicans, you have to get all the you know, alligators across Alligator Alley to get over here to Naples and such. Uh, and so it's such a concentration, it's hard to draw more evenly drawn lines. This is the uh, map for the congressional districts in the state of Florida. Um, let me show you the one. This, this is a real gerrymandered district. It was created back in, it's blue is the district. It's a, uh, uh, it was created back in 1992 and Corrine Brown got elected with me, uh, a, a black lady and she's still there. Um, and it's back before the Supreme Court again. The Supreme Court's ruled on it a couple times. Uh, the, what they did, it's part of the Voting Rights Act, the creation of these minority districts uh, of 1965, but it just really started being used after the 90 census. So they, uh, the goal is to elect more minorities to Congress. Um, Republicans love the minority districts. Minorities love the minority districts. Democrats don't. Because what happens is, you can see here, um, you know, she won with 70% of the vote. I think Obama got 73% of the vote. There's no way a Republican could win in this district. But what it does, it packs all the dis Democrats in that area. And there's not as many Democrats to, on the surrounding districts. So the Republicans control all the congressional districts all around here because all the Democrats are concentrated here, mainly African American. Uh, now, the Supreme Court's ruled uh, numerous times on different congressional districts. Uh, you know, you can't create a district just to make it a minority district. I remember one ruling back when I was in Congress in the 90s, there was a district in North Carolina that was along I-85. The only thing they had in common was Interstate 85. And all the blacks on, the si on both sides of it, you got a black district. Well, that was unconstitutional. You need to have some other in common. I'm not sure what's in common here, but at any rate, the Supreme Court's back before them again, but Kareem's been there for over 20 years. Now let me show you another district. This is a district just to the north of us, the Tampa district. And uh, Kathy Castor, her mother was a former president of the University of South Florida <laughs> and uh, was a former Secretary of Education and she ran for the Senate back in 2004 and lost. But at any rate, they've created this district and now the Republicans controlled the process in Tallahassee. Now, when I ran in 92, it was all drawn, drawn by the Democrats. Lawton Childs was governor, and Democrats controlled the state legislature. Uh, so both parties do it, so it's, you know, blame whoever you want. But this is a district that's considered a minority access district. Ha half the voters are minority, about 25% Hispanic, 25% black. Uh, it, it doesn't have a lot in common with the Bay, but this is the black area of St. Petersburg and it comes up here and gets all the urban area of Tampa. So all now the Democrats are concentrated here. Uh, this district here, Pinellas County has gone, St. Peter, a little more Democrat, and that's a 50% district right here. Uh, and, but all the other districts around here are all Republican now, because all the Democrats are concentrated here. Now that's minority gerrymandering that's required by law. And uh, the courts keep you know, ruling on it. This one's not under dispute. Um, something else, the, the control of the, the redistricting is done by the states and mainly the state legislatures. One thing that you don't read about very much, but in the past five years, Republicans have had huge success in taking over state governments. Look at the number of state legislators now that are Republican versus Democrat. 31 state legislatures are controlled by Republicans and only uh, 11 are controlled by the Democrats. I mean, that's amazing. And there's uh, only eight that are considered split, where Republicans control one house and Democrats control the other house. Um, if we look at governors, there are 31 Republican governors and 18 Democratic governors. We don't all pay much attention to some of this, but that's the power where redistricting takes place. Now, the Democrats are gearing up because the big election is coming up in 2018 and 2020. What gave Republicans so much influence on redistricting was the 2010 election, which was that wave election I talked about. 
So the Democrats now are saying, wait a minute, we're gearing up for these governor's elections and state legislative seat elections of 2018. So they're going to be real important that it's, it's a state by state issue. Um, but you can see Republicans took over and took control of Ohio and Michigan. Uh, we know about Scott Walker up here. And you know, it's interesting with governors, Republicans elected a governor in Illinois. Maryland has a Republican governor. Um, Massachusetts has a Republican governor. Interesting. Um, one of the things that this is leading to is, to me, uh, more parliamentary-like governing. And what we're finding is people are voting more party line. When I was elected, it's the 103rd Congress right here. It was party line voting, but now you can see up here, we're, you know, a lot more party line voting. So as I conclude and we'll open for discussion is, I am concerned about the demographic and geographic concentrations of, of split in our country. I don't think that's good. I think um, it's unfortunate we're moving in that direction. People think, uh, is a third party likely? Our system was not designed for political parties to start with. When they wrote the Constitution, they said, no, we don't need political parties, so there's no provision in the Constitution for political parties. Uh, we just want the best people to serve. But, and so the parties started right away after in the election of 1800 when uh, Jefferson beat uh, Adams. But um, it's hard to create a third party. The closest we came, in my opinion, was probably when Ross Perot tried back in the uh, early 90s, the year I ran. Um, as I say, I think we're going to move more to a parliamentary. We're not a parliamentary government. In parliamentary government, if you're in a party and the other party has zero power. But, you know, I always like to think of this. You know, when they wrote that Constitution, they made a complicated system. It's difficult to get things done. And that's good. It's not how easy for one party to just come in and stay in power. We change power all the time. Look at how Congress has changed from Republican control to Democratic control. Um, and we'll look at the presidential election. We keep changing presidents basically every eight year, the party. Uh, so, you know, our system is complex. We may not like it a lot of times, but it kind of writes itself. So I think um, we've come a long way, and uh, I think it's going to still work. It's still a functioning system as much as we don't like it. With that, let's open up for questions and get some comments, okay? Okay. And uh, my wife and I uh, charted all the presidential elections that we've lived through, where we voted, and we found out that in every case, we voted against the other guy. <laughs> we didn't vote for somebody, we voted to keep that other guy out. And I think this is happening and driving a lot of these statistics. No, I, I agree, as, as I pointed out, um, um, you know, before, I mean, it's people, even though they say they're independent, they really vote one party pretty much all the time. And split party voting to vote one person for president, party for president, one party for senator, very, the, the numbers, I don't have a chart to show that, but the numbers show it's, it's very rare nowadays to vote one party for president and a separate one for Congress or something like that. So it, you're, you're right. It's, uh, a lot of times people are voting against. That's the reason I say 80% of the people know how they're going to vote right now without even knowing the candidates. I've never seen that number. I'm making up that number, but. Uh, yes, there's you a question over here. Oh, okay, here, do, I'm sorry. Do you think we ought to go back to electing uh, senators as it was originally proposed? <laughs> Interesting question there, about the, the senators. Governors? As you know, you know, when they wrote the Constitution, the, the, you know, there was only like 55 people in Philadelphia that summer that uh, they didn't trust the American people. They created the Electoral College so you don't vote directly for the President of the United States. You vote for the electors. And the senators were all appointed by their state legislatures. And it wasn't until the early part of the 20th century that we started having direct election of senators. Um, I don't know if that, uh, you know, I'm not sure that would make a difference. If, you know, we can, we can talk about political parties. Let me comment one thing about political parties is, you know, Conventions don't mean much anymore because um, we have all these convention, I mean, these uh, 
primaries and caucuses. But prior to the 1970s, the smoke-filled rooms did a lot of things. That's what happened in conventions back in the, uh, we remember growing up, conventions meant something because the smoke-filled rooms did it. Now we don't have that. We have much more open government and such, but go ahead. You're, you're right, but I'm not sure. I think direct election is, is good, but I, you're, you're right in some ways. But the power changes. I mean, right now, Republicans have 31 governors and uh, 31 state legislatures. Ten years ago, it wasn't that way. I mean, the system changes, but right now, that would be the case. If they were appointed, you'd be a very different thing. I mean, you know, you're right. Where is the microphone here? I'll let Bev here. You obviously believe in term limits since you self-imposed it on yourself. And do you think that would make a difference now and you think term limits should be happening? You know, I committed to term limits when I ran in 92. It was a popular issue back there. But I've got mixed opinions about term limits. I am not the big advocate of term limits I once was. It, um, uh, it, you lose a lot of institutional knowledge when you force people to leave. It's good to have some people that understand why things ha happen the way they do. I think, and I, you know, some people have studied it more than I have, a lot of states have, state, have term limits. Like in Florida, we have an eight-year term limit in the legislature. Well, eight years, you know, you're just kind of finding your way around up there, and you're all of a sudden you're Speaker of the House. And Marco Rubio was Speaker of the Florida Legislature a number of years ago. Uh, and so I kind of like a more seasoned people, and term limits gives more power to the staff. So there's Disadvantages and advantages, and the bottom line is, the um, it's not going to happen. To make term limits for Congress requires a constitutional amendment. We rarely amend our constitution. It takes uh, I think it's the two thirds votes of the of, con of the House and the Senate and three fourths of the state legislature. So it's a really um, it's not going to happen. I'm not sure. As I say, I've got mixed opinions. Term limit. We have huge turnover in Congress as it is. I I've been gone now. Um, 12 years, I mean, I don't have that many friends left in Congress. I mean, uh, you know, they either retired or they moved on. I mean, I, you know, the, senior, the leaders on both parties I know, but they were with me. Let me see, Bev has got the microphone, so we're going to keep the microphone. How does the uh, uh, congressional work week impact bipartisanship? Uh, they, they spend just a few days working, a lot of time raising money because it costs so much to run for office now. Where do they have time to intermingle? <laughs> Uh, it's a good question. I, I, I think the microphone's working pretty good for the questions. Uh, we were actually talking about this just briefly a little earlier. It's a family unfriendly place. Uh, when you get, first of all, one comment about money, and I'll talk about it again in, uh, when we get into the election part. Um, I was in a safe area. When I got elected, I, I really didn't have a threat to get defeated because this is a Republican district. Unless somebody came from my far right and came after me because I was a social moderate, but fiscally I was quite conservative. So. Um, but on the social issues, I was on the left wing of my party, probably. Uh, not in Congress, but... Um, and so, uh, most members of Congress, as we'll see, don't really have tough elections. So they don't have to raise a lot of money. A handful of people have to raise a lot of money. Now, one of the things that's happened with Congress over the past, say, 50 years, is Congress spends less time in Washington. And it's a bipartisan issue, is how do you make it more family-friendly? I mean, I was lucky our two kids were in college when I got elected. And so um, my wife was able to come up there with me. Uh, our kids both came to Washington, got uh, master's degrees up there. Our daughter met her husband there. Uh, and so for us, it, it was ideal. I didn't think about that. But I see these others with young kids. What do you do with your kids? It used to be you'd move your kids to Washington back before the 60s and or 70s. Uh, people would move up to Washington. Congress only in session for five, six months of the year, finish up in June, come back next January. The whole family would go up, go to school and such. Uh, nowadays, you know, you commute back and forth. I mean, you, you have an unlimited travel budget for yourself, and you don't get any housing allowances or anything, but the plane travel is all paid for, not your spouses, of course. And um, so to make it family friendly, because people want to get home to be with their families, a lot of times they just make it a Tuesday, two or three night event, and uh, get people home, you take one week breaks, Sometimes, you know, when you come home, you're working. When I was home, you're constantly going around to hold town hall meetings or meeting with different groups in Sun City or going to Head Start or uh, programs or such, and visiting different programs and giving talks and such. Uh, but my district is pretty compact, just from Port Charlotte up to uh, Sun City. 
I mean, one congressman for Montana has to do a lot of flying around to get around that. So there's no easy answer. And, and the, you're right, the social life is uh, more limited because you work late at night. And uh, the people on the West Coast, the California people, and Nancy Pelosi went home every weekend, by the way. Um, and so, but that's, you've got to keep your time zone. So what they would do is live off the, their California time zone. So they liked to work at night. So working at midnight was good for them because that was a reasonable hour. They hated morning meetings, the people from the West Coast. Um, if you I was lucky I was in the same time zone. It was amazing how lucky I, you know, when I look back at it, and there were a lot of direct flights into Tampa from Washington. But um, uh, the social interaction is not what it used to be because families don't move there anymore. Families that move there, they get the kids in school, and then their opponent in the next election says, well, you're, you know, you're living in Washington. I mean, Tom Daschle, that's what he lost. He ran an ad of the million dollar house or two million dollar house he had in uh, Bethesda. And so people said, whoop, I better not do that anymore. And so they kind of stopped doing it. And, and as I was saying earlier, about 50 or 60 members sleep in their offices. They just get those inflatable beds and just blow it up and go to sleep and get up in the morning, go down to the gym and work out, shower and clean up and go to work. Uh, I don't know what the answer is because to make it family friendly, I'm not sure forcing people to stay there more time, you know, they need to have enough time and they're moving away from the two night thing to three nights. And, uh, but it, there's not an easy answer to it. And they do have a bipartisan effort to try to come up with an answer. Yeah. Uh, regarding the Electoral College, currently, whatever party or candidate wins the state, they get all the electoral votes for that state, winner take all. But it's changing slowly. Nebraska and Maine, I believe, have gone to proportional representation. So the, if you win 60% of the vote, you get 60% of the electoral vote for that state, and the other party will still get 40%, not win or take all. Right. What are the chances of that expanding in the okay. country? We're going to talk about that. California's thinking about it. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I go ahead and answer that now if you want. Uh, you know, electoral college is winner take all in almost all states except for the two that you mentioned. And those two, the, every state gets electoral college based on the number of people they have in Congress. Every state gets two for their senators and one for a member of Congress. So the smallest states, the Dakotas or Wyoming, get three Congress, I mean, three electoral votes. Um, a state like Florida, we have 27 members in the House plus two Senate, we have 29 electoral votes. So uh, what, where Maine has four electoral votes because two members of Congress, the way they allocate it, the same way in Nebraska is, uh, they allocate one per congressional district and then two for the statewide. And actually it was interesting, I think it was the last election, 2012, maybe 2008, Obama won, the, I guess the Omaha seat and got one congressional, I mean one electoral vote out of Nebraska. A lot of states are talking about it. Republicans would love to do that because you know it's winner take all and, the, and we'll talk about the advantage the Democrats have with that. But and there's a lot of discussion that states have, and some states have passed legislation and said, we'll do it if the other states do it. So let's go ahead and take a few more questions there. Yes. Uh, yes, I have uh, two questions. One of them is about the Electoral College, which there seems to be a lot of interest about now. And the other one's about the bipartisanship and partisanship in the news media. Uh, the first one being, uh, how, what are your opinions on completely abolishing the Electoral College and moving to a uh, runoff election system or a... Um, I, I'll repeat or a runoff election system, sorry if I'm not speaking to the mic loudly, a runoff election system or a multiple vote system. And the second one is, do you think that the partisanship issue that you talked about earlier might have something to do with the 24-hour news media? <laughs> well, there's no question the 24-hour news media has contributed to that. I mean, uh, the media, uh, all you know, communications change, whether it's newspapers. I mean, there's only one fair and balanced news television station we know about. Uh, <laughs> But uh, um, so you, you definitely, the, 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 you know, the, everybody's, uh, you know, these cameras that, you know, everybody's, I guarantee you somebody's filming Marco Rubio for the Democratic Party every minute he's in public. Same way with Hillary Clinton. Everybody that can is going to, they got, they hire people at the parties to watch it. So it's, it's, uh, it's a different world than back when Walter Cronkite was uh, our news source. Um, as far as the um, direct election of the president, that takes a constitutional amendment too, uh, which is unlikely. And um, uh, I, uh, what I get, uh, constitutional amendments are very rare. You know what the last constitutional amendment was? The 26th, I think. 
it was an undergraduate at the University of Texas did a uh, report, and he got, a, I think, a C on this paper. And what it is, you know, we have the first uh, 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights. There were originally 12 Bill of Rights, and only, only 10 became amendments, but there was a, a one that had started through the process of getting approval, and the requirement was uh, that you cannot raise the pay of a member of Congress during a congressional session, during that two-year period. Well, it never got the enough states, the three-fourths number of states back then, and so it just, you know, I forgot about it. Well, he wrote a little paper about it at the University of Texas, and uh, uh, he, you know, said, well, I'm going to work on it. So I think he went up and got Maine and some other states to start passing it, and before he knew it, it became a constitutional amendment. So that was in, you know, 1980s. So constitutional amendments are really hard to do. So I just kind of have the belief that, you know, we can talk about popular election, it's just not going to happen. It's kind of like uh, changing the electoral college. I mean, there's one option of doing that, but uh, term limits is a constitutional amendment. It's just not going to happen. So I just don't get wrapped up in those things. We're going to take a couple more questions, then we've got to move on. I'll be short of my answer. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is, um, uh, with divided government, and it, it's beneficial to the system to work that way, but is there, is there any effort to restore civility and respect among the two divided pieces? And then the second question is, if we keep pushing to the extremes, at some point, I think the citizens will become concerned, and then won't we need to get to a constitutional convention where we change our government completely? Well, that's, you've got several questions there. Uh, you know, there, there, you mentioned the Constitutional Convention. I mean, we've never done one, but I mean, there's been discussion of it, but a lot of people are a little scared of what if, you know, it's unlimited what can happen. Um, you know, when they went to Philadelphia in 1787, they were just gonna modify the Articles of Confederation, and then they wrote a new constitution instead. So, uh, divided government, um, I think when parties go too far off to the left or too far off to the right, it does get people upset. But then all of a sudden they say, wait a minute, if we want to be, you know, the majority, we can be able to move a little more to the center. I remember uh, when Republicans took control of Congress in 94 and the Democrats were accused of being too far off in left field, like on the assault weapons ban. I remember that vote. Uh, and so the Democrats learned, if you want to win seats in West Virginia and North Carolina, you better not even talk about guns. So you don't ever hear Nancy Pelosi talk about guns ever since 1994. So what happens is the parties say, wait a minute, you know, now Republicans have this problem on some of the social issues of gays or abortion and such. And that turns off a lot of people. That hurts a lot with the women vote, I think. But, um, but if they want to be in the majority, you know, they may go off too far to the right. They got to get, come back a little bit to become the majority. So this, this, the ship writes itself is kind of my theory. I don't like a lot of the things. In it. As far as civility, um, you know, they did some uh, civility uh, retreats for us when we were up there. It was kind of interesting. We, we went off to Hershey, Pennsylvania and got lots of free chocolate and uh, <laughs> did I love you type thing. And, uh, part of it is the question you raised about the fact we don't spend more time in Washington. And, uh, I, you know, uh, one thing, that we, we did Codell's, congressional trips that take these junkets. Um, but the junkets is where you get to know somebody. I went to India with Nancy Pelosi, and we had a nice time. Uh, my wife tells a story about Nancy. We were on the plane, it was an Air Force plane, uh, that um, they were talking about you know, celebrities and movie stars, and someone said Tom Selleck, and, who's a Republican, uh, and Nancy said, Glenda, my, my wife's name, says, I don't like Tom Selleck. He is too Republican for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got along fine with her. I mean, Rosa Delora was on that trip, Jim uh, McDermott, some real left wing, but, but we all got to be friendly. Uh, uh, Dick Gephardt was on the trip. So, uh, unfortunately, they don't do that much anymore. Um, Tom Foley tells the story that when he uh, uh, was giving a talk to uh, a group of new, newly elected members, he gave them two bits of advice. Skip a vote early on. Don't worry about being perfect voting record. Because uh, Bill Natcher was a guy from Kentucky, had a perfect voting record in 40 years. I mean, his wife had to die on the right weekend to get him to do that. And he was coming, they were wheeling him into the, the vote in a three-piece suit and IVs coming. But don't worry about, miss a vote, get it over with, that's it. And the other thing is, take trips. Uh, and you'll get to know people better. And so when I would go on trips, uh, it was always, you had to have a bipartisan delegation. And, uh, 
Um, whether it's going down to the jungles of Peru or Colombia looking at drug efforts, and you're spending a lot of money on those issues, you need to, Congress has an oversight responsibility. So um, I don't know how you increase that civility. It's not as bad as televisions make it out to be. Uh, I remember back during the impeachment, oh, I'm taking, I need to get on to the next topic. I'll, <laughs> I can tell stories too long here. Uh, 38 years since I said this. Professor Miller, I have a question. <laughs> I used I to be a professor. I taught here for a few classes, and Ted was one of my students, and he helped me in my campaign. I had campaign. him for both statistics and marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I have a number of questions, but I'll ask you one. Um, three years ago, um, the Democratic Party spent a billion dollars, I heard, on the presidential race in five swing states. I heard that one of the, that party is raising two and a half billion for this next race. If we all remember correctly that TV ads, the phone calls at home, I didn't want to answer the phone. Freedom of speech, but I'm sure the other party will match it this time. I can't imagine two and a half times what happened the last time because Florida is one of those swing states. Can we limit this in some way? Because, I mean, it was distortions. It was from both sides. Right. I mean, they both did it. One had to be countered by the other. What can be done about this? Well, I'm going to talk about it. That would lead me in to start talking about the 2016 election, and we will have some time. I'll make it short. Uh, let, me, let me do this 2016 election. But the bottom line is money is free speech. I want to get one quick question up front here. The Congress is not generally held in high regard <laughs> by the nation. And your comments would be appreciated. Is this well earned, this low? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know what it is, is, the majority of people up there are good people doing what's right for the country. I mean, you know, you can be liberal or conservative, it's, they're, they're good people. But as you pointed out, it's the media a lot of times that does it. And what I was gonna tell the short story was, I remember during the impeachment, and Joe Scarborough and um, oh, Bob Wachter, I think a, a congressman from down in Fort Lauderdale area, very liberal district down there, would get down there and he would defend Bill Clinton on, on this impeachment issue. And I remember, and people, I'd come home and say, wait, that guy's terrible. And my Republican friends said, that guy's awful. He's just always defending Bill Clinton. And so I talked to him one day, he's a really likable, nice guy, but you put a microphone in front of him and he's gonna scream and holler. I mean, he says people loved him more down in Fort Lauderdale as he defended Bill Clinton. Everyone else was afraid to def defend Bill Clinton. I remember um, oh, uh, Carolyn Maloney, who's a congresswoman from Manhattan. She was my, on the census issue. Um, you put a microphone in front of her, she's a different person. And she'd tell me, you know, we're getting ready to have a hearing. She says, now Dan, you know, I've got to bring this up and I'm going to talk about it. And she'd give me a warning. Say, if you want to avoid it, don't bring up that topic. <laughs> um, but then you put the microphone there. I, I never liked that. But I mean, some people enjoy that. And so, that, that's, so the civility, I think, is a smaller number of people than the media make it out to be. Let me move into this presidential election, uh, which is only, I think, 19 months off. <laughs> and in Florida, we're... <laughs> uh, Florida is going to be real exciting, as you said. Florida is one of the swing states. There's only about a dozen swing states. And Florida is going to have a very exciting Senate race this coming year. Uh, because Marco Rubio is not, if Rubio was running again, he would be favored. Right now it's a toss-up Senate race. We're not sure who the candidates would be. But it's going to be a um, uh, uh, very interesting, and we're in the center of it in Florida. Let me briefly call, talk about congressional elections. Uh, the House currently is 233 Republicans, 199 Democrats. The projections are the Democrats pick up a few seats, but the Republicans pretty much have a lock on the House of Re Representatives until 2022. Uh, you know, this is how the map looks right now. Charlie Cook, um, who is a respected analyst in Washington, uh, you know, he rates all the congressional seats individually. Right now, he says uh, there are two, 218 is the majority, the 435 members. 211 Republicans are in safe seats. And 
and there's 169 Democrats in safe seats. There's only 11 toss-up districts, and these are the lean or you know, likely. There aren't that many seats in play. We talk about the money. The money doesn't go to the, you know, when I was, it was hard in some ways for me to raise money <laughs> because everybody knew I was going to get reelected. I didn't need a lot of money. It was a, this is not an expensive area to run in. Um, but, you know, all the money pours into these districts right here. Uh, and I felt sorry. I, mean, I had a lot of these friends like Clay Shaw in Fort Lauderdale. I mean, he just had to raise money all the time. And it just, that was a hard thing. That's one thing you don't really like about politics is the money. So right now, uh, it's pretty much Republicans have a lock on the House of Representatives until after the next census. In the Senate, right now there's 54 Republicans and uh, 46 Democrats. A third of the Senate's up every two years, as you know, and there are 24 Republican Senate seats up next year and 10 Democratic Senate seats. It's a toss-up what's going to happen. Here is a map that was done by, I think, Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia about Senate seats. Uh, the Illinois, Mark Kirk, I, I, if I had to guess right now, he's not going to win re-election. He had a stroke a couple years ago. He's a really nice guy, um, and he's a younger guy. He's, well, maybe in mid-50s, young. <laughs> uh, Wisconsin's a swing state. Uh, Pennsylvania, there's a conservative Republican over there. Florida it should be a toss-up. I think most analysts put it in the toss-up category. Uh, you talk about Ted Strickland over here a minute ago. Uh, Ohio's running against Rob Portman. This is a seat. Harry Reid's not leaving. Barbara Boxer is um, retiring, but that's a Democratic seat. It's safe. Barbara Mikowski in Maryland is leaving, uh, retiring. That's a safe Democratic seat. So, as you can see, there, Charlie Cook only puts three toss-ups. Um, some are, you know, in that gray category. Right now, it's still early because we don't know who the candidates are. Like here in Florida, we don't know who's going to run. There's one Democrat. I think his name is Murphy over on the East Coast. That's a moderate, should be a good candidate, actually. We talk about the presidential election. Uh, the Republican advantage is American people want change. And if we go back to when Truman was president, after Truman we had Eisenhower for eight years, we had Kennedy Johnson for eight years, we had Nixon Ford for eight years, Jimmy Carter for four, then Reagan, and he was succeeded by George H.W. Bush. But Reagan was fairly popular at the end of his term, and the economy was doing well. That's the only time a party has kept control of the White House for three elections in a row. After H.W. Bush, he was defeated for re-election. Um, then you had Bill Clinton for eight years, George W. Bush for eight years. So the history is on the side of Republicans that people want change. They just, that's the way our system is operated. That's the strength of our system, I think. Now, what the Democrats uh, advantage is the Electoral College, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, and the key part is any Democrat running is going to be, for many people, considered a third term of the Obama administration. So his approval numbers um, next October will be very important. It's unlikely those numbers will get up to the 60 percent, which they almost would need to be. Uh, he, they've been improving recently. They're up in the upper 40s now. Um, this is one map of, uh, of how the uh, safe states, actually if you look at all these states, the red and blue are states that for the past six times I think have gone uh, Republican or Democrat. I mean, you don't pay much attention to these blue states. The elections all in these other states. I remember in 19, 2004, I was invited to the University of Massachusetts in, in Amherst, and I remember flying into, I think it was Hartford, Connecticut, and they picked me up and went over there for several days. And it was, a, in, in Florida, it was a race between Bush and Kerry. It was a tight, tight race. We were just getting drowned in all that information. We had a very tight Senate race between uh, Betty Castor and Mel Martinez that year. They weren't even paying any attention to the election up in Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts because they knew how they were going to vote. I mean, it was, no one was going in there to visit. So there's only a handful of states now that are the swing states. Uh, now, this is a little different way to spread it out because some of these states you know, are lean uh, and you know, things are changing around in a lot of these states. And it depends on who the candidates are. Um, uh, Iowa's a, a lean Democratic state. These states have mainly gone Democrat in, in recent years. These states have all gone Republican. You know, Missouri, I think, has gone back and forth a couple of times. But, uh, but the real swing states are these. So, 
it, it really focuses on those 10, 12 swing states. You talk about money. First of all, you know, public funding is available for presidential elections. We just filed our taxes, and you have a place to check to give $3 to the presidential campaign. I, not many people do it, <laughs> but it's there. It, it, it's a system that just doesn't work. Um, and we get to mo money, the Buckley versus Vallejo is the classic case in campaign finance. Supreme Court ruled in 1976 that essentially spending money is free speech. And there's been ruling after ruling after ruling after 1976. So it's not just the Citizens United that people get upset about. Uh, that was, you know, announced a couple years ago. Uh, it's been going on. In 1976, uh, it said any candidate can spend as much money as they want. Vern Buchanan, our congressman here, spent, I think, $7 million getting elected to Congress the first time. It was mostly his money. That's his right. Nothing you can do about it. But uh, Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York City and spent $100 million every time he ran. So, uh, oh, Scott, our governor here, why did he spend $50 million or something of his money to get elected governor? That's his constitutional right. And if you want to give to an organization, if you're a pro-life person and you want to give money to a pro-life organization to support pro-life candidates, that's your right. You can't tell me you can't support them. And the same way if you're a pro-choice person or you're pro-gun or you want to have gun control. So the thing is about money, it's a First Amendment issue. Now, now we're getting back to constitutional amendments. I don't know anyone that wants to play around with the First Amendment to try to raise money. So, you know, money is unfortunate. It's, I don't like it. Nobody liked raising it. It's a bad part of the system. But we're stuck with it. It's, and it's not a campaign issue. Most American voters don't really care much about what's happening. Um, when you do uh, elections, you have two pots of money you work with, and I'll get back to this primary money and general election money. Uh, the Republicans, in particular, were concerned the way th the, the election went in 2012, and so they're making changes this time around. And so these are the changes you're going to see. Is first of all, the calendar is more firm and set. Um, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and uh, Nevada always claim they want to go first in, uh, during February. Well, back in 2008 and 12, states like Florida said, well, we don't, don't want to give them all the power. We want to get the attention. So they moved their date up to January. Um, and, and so what had happened is uh, then you know, New Hampshire is in their constitution. They have to be the first primary. So they were like the first week in January. Uh, now everybody's going to stick with it. Actually, in 2008, when Florida moved their primary to January, that was a very critical thing for Obama because um, Hillary Clinton was going to win Florida, and she did win Florida, but it didn't count. No delegates. She, they were not even allowed to campaign here. I mean, the demographics of Florida was, was what Hillary Clinton needed, uh, and she couldn't win Florida because it was... The Democratic Party has set the rules. If Florida has their primary in January, they're not going to get any delegates to the convention. Uh, another thing Republicans learned is they, they had too many debates, and the moderators, you know, I don't think Republicans want Chris Matthews to moderate a Republican debate. <laughs> Candy. <laughs> Candy, yeah. And uh, conventions are earlier. And conventions have historically, um, taking place around Labor Day. That's kind of the kickoff people think about in the fall. Um, but you need to get, you, we'll know in April or May who the nominees are. So waiting until the convention, conventions don't mean much anymore. Uh, they're a big party, they're fun to go to. I have no interest in going back. But uh, uh, when I was in Congress, I got invited to the, the two. Um, and so they're gonna be in July this year. And so by moving it, one thing, it gives the candidates more time to get organized, get staffed up, get prepared for the campaign, and gear up. The other thing is this money pot. I said that Obama and Romney raised the same amount of money about, I don't know, say a billion dollars each, total amount of money. But what you raise for the primary, you can only spend in the primary, well, you can, you, what you raise for the general election cannot be used for the primary. And so what what happened was Romney had to use all of his primary money to get the nomination. Obama didn't have anybody running against him in the nomination for the nomination on the Democratic side. He spent all his money during the summer beating the heck out of Romney, and uh, it was hard for Romney to ever recover. Uh, and then in the fall, they each, each had the same amount of money to work with. So moving the conventions earlier is good. Uh, we talked about the super PACs. Um, the money is 
Um, even going to be more extreme than it's been in the past. It's going to be two and a half billion, it could be. Um, it's, but I don't know what you do about it. I mean, I wish there was an answer to it. It's a free speech issue, and that's, we're stuck with it. Um, February, you know, you know, Iowa's a caucus state. 100,000 people or so show up on the Republican and the Democratic caucus. Well, Iowa has been a very poor predictor of who gets the nomination, you know, who becomes president, with one big exception, Barack Obama. <laughs> Barack Obama won Iowa, and it was very critical for Obama because it showed a black candidate could win a white state. So that got him off. But who won it on the Republican side? Rick Santorum, who won eight years ago, kind of an unknown preacher, governor from Arkansas. Um, um, Huckabee. Huckabee, Mike Huckabee. Uh, so Iowa is not a good predictor. The religious right dominates very much in the um, uh, Republican primary there. Uh, on the Democratic side, it's quite liberal. One reason Obama was able to win was Iraq war was a big issue back in January and February of uh, 2008. And he was the only candidate that said, I was against the war from the beginning. Hillary and Joe Biden and Chris Dodd and uh, John Edwards had all voted to allow Bush to go to Iraq. Iowa is next, uh, and that is a state where 60% of the people claim to be independent. And they, don't, they can decide that when they walk into the polling place to vote as a Democrat or Republican. It's a much more moderate state. South Carolina, on the Republican side, the religious right, again, is a powerful um, voting block in that state. Um, Obama won South Carolina because half the Democratic voters are African American in South Carolina. Nevada, we, no one pays much attention to Nevada. Uh, but if you're running, and, you know, and we'll talk about the candidates here in a minute, you've got to figure out how you're going to handle these. You can't ignore them. I mean, if, if you're, Rudy Giuliani had a problem because he was socially a little more moderate, so the social conservatives in Iowa and South Carolina weren't going to have anything to do with Rudy Giuliani. And he had a problem because Mitt Romney was going to carry New Hampshire. He, he was counting on Florida, but he couldn't, he couldn't wait because these first four states go so, uh, set the, the tone of the campaign. Um, this is uh, Larry Sabato is at the University of Virginia, and he's a real good analyst. And so I don't know if you can read that from here. Um, so I'm just reprinting his. It was a good outline. Um, you can go to the University of Virginia website. Uh, well, it's, I forget what it's called there. It's Center for Politics or something. Uh, on the Republican side, there are three major contenders right now. Now, a lot of times things are going to change between now and uh, next year at this time. Next year and this time, we'll know the not candidates. But right now, the top three are Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and Scott Walker. Uh, this kind of gives a good uh, area. I was surprised Bush ever got in the race. I didn't think he was going to jump in. I think the country's kind of bushed out. Uh, <laughs> but he's an establishment candidate. A lot of people that vote in primaries don't like the establishment. Scott Walker and Marco Rubio have good connections within the Tea Party, the real conservative groups. Uh, they're acceptable on the social issues, and um, they, the establishment likes them. Now, Bush, what's going on now is what's called the invisible primary. They're getting their staff together. You need experienced pollsters, experienced managers and such, and you need to start finding where the money is. Uh, you need to be able to have $75 million this year to raise in the primary. And it's harder to raise primary money than it is for the general election money. Um, and probably they're all going to be able to do that. With these super PACs, Marco Rubio's got this very wealthy, I think Brandon is his name, is a car dealership in uh, Miami area who's going to pour millions into uh, the campaign. Uh, you know, um, who is a very wealthy uh, man out of Las Vegas that poured tens of millions of dollars? Um, Adelson, yeah. And who is a real liberal uh, Democrat from Czechoslovakia or somewhere? Soros. 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 George Soros. I mean, they pour, yeah, I mean, they pour tens of millions in the race. So, I mean, they were doing it before the super PACs. And so the super PACs just makes it all the easier. Um, the article in the paper this morning, now, this, this week in the Sarasota paper, was that Jeb is just going to let his super PAC run the, a lot of the campaign. The main require, the law about it is you can't coordinate between the super PAC and the campaign. But one thing you know, Jeb's putting over in the super PAC are his closest advisors. <laughs> um, but they've got to be careful of separating it. So anyway, those are the top three at this time. Uh, this is uh, 
the second tier, you can see, uh, um, you know, Ted Cruz is not liked by anybody on the Republican or Democrat side. Uh, <laughs> um, Rand Paul, I knew his father, Ron Paul, who, um, um, you know, was, is a libertarian. Rand's uh, dovish positions on foreign policy can hurt him in here. Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee are going to be good with the social conservatives. Uh, ben Carson is, but the problem is they're not going to be able to raise the money and they don't have a wide enough appeal. Mike Huckabee won Iowa back in 2008 and he, and he hadn't even been to New Hampshire to campaign, so he just couldn't go anywhere. Now, on the Democratic side, the tier one candidates are <laughs> tier one. Uh, there is no tier two, by the way. I'll show you tier three. Uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be interesting. The biggest challenge, I think, for Hillary Clinton is she's been living in a bubble for over 20 years. She's had Secret Service protection. It's not her fault. I mean, she's had Secret Service protection since 2000 and, I mean, since 1992. Prior to that, she was the wife of the governor and she had security. She doesn't drive a car. It's going to be hard to relate, in my opinion. And it's going to get more difficult to, she's a celebrity. She can't go anywhere without being a celebrity, and she doesn't, you gotta be careful what she says to the press. Um, she's got better consultants now. She, you know, it was a poorly run campaign in 2008. Everybody thought she would easily win, but between the problems about Florida not counting, and she wasn't organized in a lot of these caucus states, uh, she didn't win. So whether she can pull it off, I don't know. Here's here th tier three. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, one of the problems the Democrats have right now as I showed you, the state legislators, so there's 4,000 Republican state legislators and 3,000 Democrats. That's the farm team for Congress. And when you have 31 Republican governors, we mainly elect governors for president. There aren't a lot of Democratic governors can move in. So the, there's a smaller farm team for state legislative seats in state legislative seats that will move on to run for Congress and same way for um, the presidency. I mean, there's no tier two in the Democratic Party is a problem. And do you see anyone up there that, I mean, Bernie Sanders is a socialist, um, and so he can't even run unless he changes and becomes a Democrat. Lincoln Chafee was a Republican, actually. Uh, Martin O'Malley would be the closest one. Um, uh, so Elizabeth Warren would be a strong candidate, and maybe a stronger candidate. I mean, she says she's not running. So, I mean, this, they don't put her up here because she says she's absolutely not running. So, now, if Hillary stumbles and decides not to run, then it's a whole new ball field, and so some names may pop up. So, my conclusion is, I mean, this is 19 months out. I'm a Republican. Is I think the Republican, whoever the nominee is going to be, and I think it's probably going to be Scott Walker, if I had to pick right now. Um, that's just a, a guess, you know, you know, not based on much of anything. Uh, but the American people want change after eight years. And so the change is going to be the dominant thing, even though Electoral College favors the um, Democrats. All right, now we have time for some questions. Uh, I rushed through that, but uh, yes. Let me draw, draw out a name. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I know John Kasich well. He's had, he's had government experience uh, about, what, 20 years in the House, something like that? Something like that. And then he had business experience, and he's won uh, Ohio by 31 points the last election, his second term. Um, he's a conservative, right. but, I, but I don't think he's Tea Party. Correct. He's a, a bit middle of the road. And the state of Ohio has done very well. Right. I mean, he's a shoe in for uh, whatever he runs for from Ohio. Well, John Kasich, I know, I was on the budget committee with him. He was chairman of the budget committee. And uh, he ran for president in 2000, didn't go very far, as you might know. Uh, and then he went to work for somebody in New York, Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers okay. And then he had a TV show on Fox for a little while, and then he ran for governor and just got reelected. I mean, the Democrat candidate collapsed, so I mean, he won. It. So it wasn't a, uh, you know, a good comparison with other elections. But uh, Kasich's thinking about it. He has visited Iowa and New Hampshire recently in the past week or so. Uh, he could be a strong candidate. He has a, a lot of um, paper trail as a, as a television person and such. He shoots from the hip a lot. <laughs> uh, I like him. Uh, whether he, he could enter. The problem is now, this invisible primary, they, all the good consultants, fundraisers, the money people are kind of committed. Not all of them, but it's hard to jump in 
uh, you know, very far as all these other people have kind of grabbed the, the key supporters. So, so John Kasich, you know, I thought it was a solid chance. He had to get reelected last November, so he couldn't get talk about running. But now he's trying to think about it. But I think it's almost too late already to jump into that race. He could be a VP. Uh, Rob Portman had thought about it. He's the, the current senator, but he's got to run, win re-election. Um, so let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, here's one over here. <laughs> uh, we have candidates in, in, uh, in the Republican Party. A question comes up to, in my mind with what's happened with illegal immigration and everything. Is that a factor to occur in getting out the vote and who's going to be voting this year versus pr previous years. You talking about whether illegals would vote, you mean? Yes. I, you know, it could happen, but it's going it to be in such small numbers, it's not going to be a factor, I don't think. I mean, it's against the law, and so why would somebody want, you know, when 100 million people are going to vote, why would one illegal want to cast a vote, which wouldn't make much difference uh, at the presidential level? So. Um, I'm not hung up about illegals voting. I mean, you know, there's a lot of safeguards to keep that from happening, but it could happen. There's no question about it. But I don't think it'd be a, I'm not sure I'm answering the specific question. Well, it, it takes seven years, I think, in the United States to be a U.S. citizen. So you have to be a U.S. citizen to vote. And so are, are there some illegals that are registered? Yeah, I'm sure there are, but it's not enough numbers to make a difference. The country is moving, uh, you know, White Americans are become moving in a smaller percentage. It represents about 70% now. Hispanics are about 15%, and that's the fastest growing area. But Hispanics may have 50% of the population. They don't vote in high numbers. They're like 10% of the vote. Uh, the Hispanic vote is something the Republicans have had some success. I mean, if Marco Rubio uh, was a nominee, or Jeb Bush, who's married to a Mexican-American lady, um, and very fluent in Spanish, you know, it couldn't make a difference. You know, there are two Hispanic governors in the United States, both Republican, in Nevada and in uh, New Mexico. So Republicans are making some inroads into that Hispanic vote. And so Republicans hope it doesn't happen what, with the black vote, where it went totally over to the Democratic side. Yeah. Uh, many people that I've talked with uh, feel that the election process takes much too long in this country. Um, you have things happening like in the last election where uh, Clinton was absolutely going to win and be the nominee, and turned out she didn't. It was a long time, took a long time. Is there any way to shorten this process instead of making it longer, which is what seems to be happening? Well, you know, you're going to run up against the Constitution. I mean, the Constitution says you can. You, you can start running today for the next presidential election if you wanted to. I mean, that would restrict, uh, you know, freedom of speech or such. And so, um, I agree, it's too long. I mean, we're 19 months away from it. And look how much focus, I mean, this room is more focused on the election than, than the general public is. But I, so I agree with you, it's kind of like money. I don't like it either, but, you know, the Constitution would not allow us. Like in England and other countries, they put a time limit, you're right. But that would be unconstitutional under our system. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you perceive the impact of voter apathy and which party it seems to help. Uh -huh. um, in particular, in the last election, uh, it seems to me that there may have been too much voter apathy on the Republicans' part. Instead of coalescing around whoever it is and say anyone but Obama, there wasn't enough interest in um, in Romney as a nominee so that perhaps people stayed away from the polls and we got what we got. We got another four years of Obama. I think apathy is an ongoing problem, but the voter turnout hasn't been that dramatically different. I mean, one thing Obama did, he energized a lot of people to vote. A lot of minorities got out. More young people got out to vote. One of the problems is we don't have enough young people voting. They, uh, so a Marco Rubio could have that same effect by you know, having a Hispanic candidate who's 43 years old. He would be the third youngest president if he got elected. Hillary Clinton would be the second oldest president elected. I, a little bit of trivia. <laughs> I mean, Hillary would be just under, I think, Reagan's age. Yes? Um, I'm curious about what you have to say about two candidates who are both strong 
candidates from Florida. One mentored the other, in fact, as I understand it. Oh, why would they both be entering the race and probably divide the support that they might have as a single candidate? You know, that's an interesting point. I mean, I don't know Mark. I've met Marco Rubio a few times, always impressed with him, so I don't know enough about him. And Jeb was governor for a number of the years I was in Washington. Got a lot of respect for both of them. I, you know, it's a little surprising, but you know, if you're going to run, this is the only chance Jeb is going to run. He can't, if he doesn't run this time, he's never going to run. And uh, I was surprised his wife does not like politics. She did not like Tallahassee. So I thought just from a personal standpoint, he would not want to do that. So I was surprised, and so I think a lot of people were surprised that he got into it. And then Marco Rubio has to decide, do you want to be a legislator for a long period of time, or now is the time? You know, we, mainly, we rarely elect senators to, Congress, to, to the presidency. Kennedy was elected in Obama, but if you look back at governors, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, we elect governors. And so, you know, sitting in the, in the Senate for another, you know, 10, 12 years old, is, is now is time. You know, Obama got elected, how old was Obama, 45 or something, when he got elected in 2008, and uh, I, so I'm surprised they're both running too. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Oh, I, I have no problem about a woman running. I mean, there's, um, and, you know, and that's something that Hillary Clinton's strength is, that she should be able to draw the female vote out more. But then there's a lot of women I've heard, oh, uh, but, but, but she should. I mean, just like Obama energized the black vote. The blacks voted in a higher percentage than whites in the last election, a couple elections, because of Obama. So she will energize the female vote. They voted a higher percentage than men do. Uh, so, that, I mean, that is a strength for her, is to get that female vote. Uh, then, you know, but the thing is, once people have been around for as many decades as she's been around, you know, you get a lot of negatives too. I mean, her popularity went way up when she was Secretary of State, but it's coming back down to reality. And I think this bubble is going to be a problem for her. I mean, just, I remember, I think it was George H.W. Bush, when he was president, went into a grocery store and saw a scanner and, the, and said, oh, wow, is this amazing? Well, I mean, he was in a bubble. He was vice president for eight years and then president. He didn't go into the grocery store. I mean, you know, Hillary doesn't go into Publix and go to the deli and ask for a uh, chicken salad sandwich. Hi. Uh, I was going to ask, do you think that there are any uh, specific social issues that might impact the uh, votes uh, that are coming from the swing states like Florida, things like that? Any, uh, for. 2016. That's a good question. The social issues, it's interesting to me on the, on the issue of gays issue, how the American people have changed so dramatically so fast. Marco Rubio was asked the question, would you go to a, a gay marriage? And he said, yes, if it's a friend of mine or a relative. I mean, 20 years ago, nobody would say that. <laughs> um, so Republicans are much, you know, Republicans use that as a wedge issue during the 90s and, and for the first part of this century to drive out vote, the gay issue. Abortion issues is a more sensitive issue. I, you know, I had to deal with that. I, I'm a social moderate uh, when I ran, and um, uh, it was always a difficult question to answer. People that feel strong on abortion consider it murder. And so and they feel intense about that issue. So it, it, it drives the vote. It can affect the primaries. And as I said, social conservatives are a big part of the Iowa caucuses for Republicans and South Carolina and some other states. So it can affect the, again, the nomination. That's the reason of Rudy Giuliani, who had a little more moderate social positions, really just couldn't get you know, any traction because of that. So social issues um, will affect the election. Um, and then, but you know, a lot of the people, are, they may be pro-life, but they don't talk about it or dwell on it. I mean, Mike Huckabee will dwell on it and Rick Santorum dwell on it, but they're not gonna go anywhere. But you don't hear Marco Rubio talk about it much Bobby Jindal talks about it a lot, and uh, so some of these that talk about it a lot are you know, not going to go anywhere because they're too far in a narrow group of people. Yeah. Uh, my question was about issues during the campaign as well. Uh, which, I, I think foreign policy is going to be probably one of the biggest talking points and probably going to be coming up in the debates the most uh, during the presidential election. Which side do you think that favors? Which <laughs> side do you think has better foreign policy uh, debating talk points? That's a good question about which party would do better with the foreign policy issues. Um, Republicans historically have always been the ones 
the strongest on national defense than the Democrats. Um, and this foreign policy things, you know, a lot of things can happen between now and next year in, in the world. I mean, it's, you know, you get a lot more beheadings or Americans, you know, being beheaded or such, and how Obama handles it. It becomes a sensitive issue. So uh, Rubio has tried to, you know, be, get more involved in uh, national foreign affairs issues and such. So, um, you know, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Now, you know, that's a plus, but there's negatives too, having been Secretary of State. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, Bill Clinton never had a lot of foreign policy experience, and certainly Barack Obama never did. Uh, and, uh, but right now, it, I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but it's going to be a key issue, I agree. Hi yes. there. Oh, oh, back here. Oh, Hi. there you are. Um, you were talking about the uh, decline in the importance of conventions, and uh, I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about party platforms and if they are kind of falling apart as well. Party platform. I, you know, I don't know much about party platforms. I never paid any attention to them, so it was not irrelevant. Uh, that was just me. I mean, I, uh, what happened with conventions? I say we remember the conventions. What what changed things was the 1968 Democratic convention in Chicago, where Humphrey was getting the nomination and McCarthy uh, was running, and uh, you know they had all the riots in the streets of Chicago, and so that's when they started changing things on the Democratic side and the Republicans then followed suit and said we're going to have a more open and transparent system and we started having primaries and caucuses and so that was the, the transition. But the old smoke-filled rooms, there's a lot of good things to say about that I think. <laughs> uh, I mean there's one person, we have a couple people that haven't asked a question here so let's get those in and, uh, and we're nearing the end here. So, Can you tell us uh, what are the most important reasons you think Scott Walker will emerge as the Republican nominee? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't have a lot of, you know, you know, basis for this. You know, he's, I think he can raise the money. He won three governor's races and raised 50, 60 million dollars, has a nationwide network of people, so he's a darling for people for fighting organized labor issues within the Republican ranks. He um, never finished college, that's a little minor drawback, um, but he, uh, he's acceptable to the Tea Party and the establishment like him. He was a governor. People like governors to be president. They're, they're executives moving into another executive position rather than a legislator. Rubio is 43, you know, he's just finishing six years in the Senate, so there's some concern by Republicans as if that Rubio is, is not, you know, with you know, enough experience on his belt. So I, you know, this is just, I mean, I have no, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I just like to give an opinion. <laughs> How do you feel about Bobby Jindal? You just mentioned him a few moments ago. Bobby, I got to know Bobby when he was in college, because Bobby and my son went to college together at Brown University up in Rhode Island, and uh, Bobby was president of the College for Republicans, and my son was vice president of College for Republicans, and they were the two Republicans at Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so, I follow Bobby. That, see, Bobby, see, my son graduated. Bobby's a year uh, younger than he was a Rhodes Fellow and scholar and such. He he's not leaving Louisiana very popular, and uh, he's socially very conservative. Smart as heck. I mean, he's really a smart guy, but he's, I think his social conservatism is going to hurt him. And he's not very popular in Louisiana. They've got all kinds of problems. So I don't see him going much further. I like him personally. I just have a lot of. Bobby Jindal is an Indian American. You know, there's two Indian American governors in the United States, both Republicans Haley in South Carolina and uh, Bobby Jindal in Louisiana. Yes. Do you think that climate change can become an issue? I know it's much more important among the younger voters, younger people these days. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, some issues like campaign finance, it's not going to make a difference on the vote. I don't think climate change, it, it can energize some people, but it's not going to be a deciding factor in the election. What the candidates have to be able to be smart to do that is to know how to answer questions. And that's what they, you need these consultants for. It's kind of like on the abortion issue. I remember I had a consultant help me. I didn't, you know, when I ran, state your position in as few words as you can. You know, I, I would say, I'll never forget, it's a personal and private decision that ultimately is up to the woman. I 
And, you know, you have to say it with com empathy and compassion and all that. But I had a short answer. Because you're not going to change anybody's opinion on it. And so there's a lot of issues like that you need an answer. Uh, Scott Walker has to get prepared for that. Someone asked him about uh, evolution. What's your opinion about evolution? You need to know how to answer that question. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, and so the climate change, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a big issue in the election. Just Have like, you heard of a movie called Merchants of Doubt? I've heard of it, but no. But it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know it's, it's big within one block of voters, but I think that block of voters is going to vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> And the rest, I don't think it's, it's an issue that gets people. Republicans have to be careful about denying the existence of climate change. So the, you know, the Republicans have to be careful of how they handle that issue. Uh, they have to finesse that issue in what they have to do. I mean, it's, you know, how do you handle the coal issue in states like Kentucky and West Virginia and Indiana or Pennsylvania and such? So it's an issue, but I don't think it's going to become, foreign policy be a much more important issue. Dan okay. For an hour and a half. I think All it's right. time to wrap it up. Thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs>